In the Beginning, Part 2, The Transmission and Credibility of the Genesis Text. First, a little something about the book for those of you who were not here last week. Um, uh, in the Beginning, Science and Scripture Confirm Creation is the full title. Um, and uh, there's the uh, front uh, of the book. And it's edited by Brian Ball, who uh, was born in England and had got his MA in religion from Andrews and then a PhD from the University of London. He's been a church pastor, conference president, principal of Avondale College, and finally president of the South Pacific Union, uh, South Pacific Division, excuse me. He's married to uh, his wife, Don, and he has three children. This chapter, uh, or the, the, uh, the book itself, is written from a perspective that views scripture as decisive, and therefore they spend a lot more time with scripture itself. As the introduction says, its authority takes precedence over all other sources of information concerning origins, which is an interesting uh, approach, one that scientists sometimes have some difficulty with. Um, it's mostly about theology and evidence for the faithful transmission of the text, which is our topic today, arguments against higher criticism and for a view consonant with Jesus and the New Testament. It does have some scientific chapters uh, um, written by some people that we know and some of the people that uh, most of us don't. Uh, Ariel Roth uh, wrote one of the chapters and that's part of how I, uh, the book came to my attention. I think they gave him a free copy or something like that. Uh, although free should be in quotes given all the work that was in, put into that. Um, and it also finally deals with theistic evolution and evolutionary mor morality and we'll be uh, coming to those uh, later. Uh, this particular chapter is written by Robert McIver, and uh, some of you may be like I was before this and not really know the man. Uh, basically, he got his uh, Bachelor of Science in Canterbury in 1973, and then a uh, teaching college diploma, I think it's what it's called, from Christchurch Teachers College in New Zealand in 1974. Uh, apparently taught there for a while. Got a BA in Theology from PUC and a uh, uh, Bachelor of Divinity from the University of London, um, and then got his MA and PhD from Andrews, and is currently teaching at Avondale College. His uh, particular specialty is the Gospel of Matthew, uh, but uh, uh, as most people who uh, wind up in that uh, profession are, he has fairly wide-ranging interests, and one of them turned out to be the Hebrew text as well. Um, his, his interest, one of his interests was in the uh, written versus oral. Uh, he has written on oral versus written uh, transmission of text, and that particularly is relevant to Matthew in that the question is how far was the text transmitted orally before it was uh, transmitted in writing. Um, and uh, he is also married and has two daughters. He starts out his, uh, his uh, article with a uh, quote. Behind the book of Genesis is a remarkable tale of preservation through some very difficult times. This chapter will trace some of the challenges faced in safeguarding and transmission of the written text over a period of more than two millennia. Evidence will be provided that will enable an assessment to be made as to how well the text of Genesis has been maintained over these centuries. And at first, uh, if you look at it and you don't understand the background, it, this might be kind of a uh, somewhat academic exercise. But um, the background that he is writing about is the Enlightenment um, started out by trying to assert that the early religion, which was pure and undefiled to begin with and then got corrupted by, uh, um, well, you can blame it on whoever you want to, the uh, 
the early priests, uh, perhaps when Constantine became uh, a Christian. Um, it's very interesting because uh, uh, when the Roman Empire adopted Christianity seems to be a point at which uh, atheists of the earlier ages and uh, uh, many Protestants uh, kind of agreed uh, a lot of abuses, uh, a lot of wrong doctrines crept into the church. Of course, identifying which ones those were is a different question. But their early religion was basically ethical. Jesus was an ethical teacher. And um, then these myths grew up around it. And the mythical elements are usually thought to be the miraculous ones, you see. What we need is a religion that tells you what to do, but doesn't have God interfering in human history. Um, some progress, although not as much as is sometimes claimed, was made in challenging Jesus' claim to be God through textual criticism. For example, 1 John 5, 7 simply disappeared when you looked at the objective evidence. It was in the Vulgate, yes. Um, but it was not in any of the early Greek manuscripts. In fact, Erasmus told the Pope that he'd uh, put it into his Greek Bible if he, could, if he could find a text in Greek that said it. They found one text, so it got into the Textus Receptus. But that was a very late text, probably corrupted from the Vulgate itself. Um, early, early on, the text uh, God was manifest in the flesh, um, turned out in the earliest manuscripts to say who was manifest in the flesh. And the only difference is a dot in the middle of a circle versus no dot. Theos versus os. And um, the, the theos was, an abbrevi it was abbreviated theta sigma instead of um, uh, instead of being spelled completely out. Um, and so uh, there were claims that were made that really uh, Jesus didn't claim to be divine, you see, and then um, various mythical elements grew up around it. That was the attempt that was made. And so people thought, well, maybe we can do the same kind of thing with Hebrew. That, by the way, is known as lower criticism. The text really doesn't say what you think it does. Um, the hope was raised that the earliest manuscripts of the Old Testament would also turn out to be non-miraculous. So if we could just get behind the accretions of the legends that have grown up around uh, the Old Testament, then they would also turn out to be non-miraculous, uh, non and therefore we could have an early ethical religion of Israel that culminated in the ethical religion of Jesus. Um, and unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of evidence for this kind of thing. So what people do when they have a nice theory and there's not any evidence, they try to explain why their theory is better than the other theory. And so the claim was made that the Hebrew manuscripts were all 1,500 to 2,000 years later than the original, and that a lot could happen in that time to the text that if we really got back to the old Hebrew, we'd find out um, that it really wasn't uh, talking about anything miraculous at all. And that background forms the question that is, uh, that is being answered in this chapter, and that is how reliable is really the text of the Old Testament that we have today? That if I go out and buy a Hebrew Bible, for example, is that really exactly what you would find if you were to go back to the old manuscripts? Um, once we get to printing, the text basically freezes. There have been no significant changes in the text. And in fact, the only changes that have taken place to the text are where people have found uh, small mistakes in the, in the printing and corrected them. Um, and of course, every printing has its own one or two mistakes. And nowadays, with computerized records, you can uh, you can uh, completely freeze the text. But uh, before that, 
The Bible had to be written by scribes. And if you've ever tried to write something out longhand, especially a long, long passage, you can understand the difficulty in getting it exactly right. Uh, in fact, most of the time when people wrote books, they didn't just pick anybody off the street to do it. First of all, the person had to be able to read. Secondly, the person had to be able to read the language. And third, the, people, uh, the person had to have good enough handwriting to where you could read it after he got done writing. And it was almost always he. Uh, but what the, so you had, you had professional scribes whose job was simply to write things down and write them down accurately. Um, they were uh, basically the mimeograph machines of their day. Uh, and whenever that happens, variants creep into text. There are several w uh, ways that that can happen. It's very much like the mutations that will creep into DNA, and there are certain kinds of mutations that will, will uh, go into DNA. Um, there's point mutations, there's frame shifts, there's, uh, there's copying things in block. You can see the exact same kinds of things uh, when you're copying a text. Uh, scribes may unconsciously correct grammar, uh, at least uh, in their way of, of viewing things. Um, they may also introduce spelling variants. Uh, they may write synonyms without thinking about it. Um, they, one of the practices that was done sometimes if you wanted to produce a lot of copies of something is to have somebody in the middle of the room reading slowly, and everybody else sitting down writing out what was being read. And of course, whenever that happens, every once in a while, somebody hears the wrong word and puts it in. Um, there's also, if you're sitting down writing all by yourself, there are problems with you're reading across a line and it ends with something and then you, there's the next line ends with the same thing. And what will sometimes happen is that you'll finish writing the first instance and you'll skip down to the second one and omit a whole line. And um, the uh, author gives an example of, how, of uh, where that might have happened. Um, there, you can also have the reverse thing where you copy the same line twice because you copied it the first time, you came to the second time, when you went back to look at it, you looked at the first one again and then went right, right back over it. Not as common, but uh, can happen. And that goes by a fancy uh, Greek name called homoiteluton. Um, some letters, look alike. Uh, in Hebrew, in particular, Dalit and Resh, and let me uh, just show you a quasi-medieval uh, alphabet, and here is Aleph, Beth, uh, Gimel, and there's Dalit, and you'll notice that the difference between Dalit and Resh is simply that Resh has this rounded off instead of that sticking out there. Now, for those of you who are interested in the biblical um, uh, record, you may re remember that Jesus said, not one jot or one tittle shall pass from the law until all these things be fulfilled. Well, the jot is actually the iota, or to be precise, it would be the yod in Hebrew. It's this little letter, the smallest of all the letters. And the tittle is precisely that little thing that sticks out that makes a dalit a dalit instead of a resh. Now you'll notice there's some other letters that you know if you if you're a little sloppy you might mix up these two or perhaps what's even more interesting is this one has a long tail, this one has a short tail, and that's the only difference. And I'm going to show you some manuscripts where you can see that it's very difficult to tell which is which. <laughs>
Um, there's a Codex Leningradis, uh, Leningradensis, that's the, uh, the, the one out of which they print all of the Bibles and then they put variants uh, for later ones uh, or where people suspect that the text is wrong. But very much like the Masoretes, they basically don't touch the text itself. They leave it right where it is and then they put notes around it. And you'll notice that in uh, the codex here, there are also notes of the same kind. But um, if you're looking at this and you're, um, the, that Zion is pretty easy to tell. But here's a resh. And you can see all you need is a little tiny tail on that and that would be a dalit. And um, that's actually caused some confusion. Now here's um, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Isaiah Scroll to be precise. And uh, this is the passage where it says, uh, say to the righteous that it will be well with him. And here's a dalit. Notice that in this case, the little tail goes up. And you're saying, okay, good. Well, but that is a rash. Whoa, <laughs> that is close. Now, if you go down here and you look at a few more of these, let's say, um, is that a resh or dollar? It actually would help if you knew Hebrew and so you know what it was supposed to be. Um, that one happens to be a resh. You can see how uh, that could get confusing. And um, here's an even worse one that, that he doesn't mention, but it's, uh, uh, it's famous in particular in, the, in Genesis. It's so bad that almost all of the instances where it should say uh, he, it says she. It's uh, he instead of who. And, and you'll, uh, here is an Aleph which is pretty easy to recognize. And then these are actually two letters. And tell me which one is a wow and which one is a yod. Well, if you don't know the language, you're just about lost. This one actually turns out to be the yod. In this particular text, it has a little more of a tail on it, like this yod here. and. Um, and, and this one has a little shorter one and goes down a little bit longer. But you can see it would be very difficult for somebody to read if somebody weren't really careful with their handwriting. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And that's why in, um, in the uh, Codex Leningradensis, you actually have a number of words where everybody recognizes that there's a problem. Um, but uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, they don't want to correct it uh, from, from the, from the uh, copy that was made before because once you start correcting things, then you, um, then you lose all of the uh, information that you already had. You never know which ones you're supposed to correct and which ones you're not. Um, In Genesis 10.4, there's an example. There's a, the, a, a people called the Dodenim, or sometimes known as the Rodenim, and which one is correct, and the fact of the matter is right now, we really don't know. So those are some of the difficulties of uh, writing text. Well, what happened was, in the later centuries, um, the Masoretes, um, it's spelled both ways, with one and two S. Um, carefully counted the numbers of letters in the Bible. Um, they compiled statistics. They looked at, uh, you know, which words were where and so forth, and. Um, they also added vowels because, as you may have noticed, the ancient text didn't have any vowels. The Codex Leningradensis had these little dots above and below. Those told you what, uh, how you were supposed to pronounce something, whether it was uh, um, 
avad or evad. Um, before that, you know, it's a very much like if you took English and took all the vowels out. Just imagine trying to read all that. Uh, we actually do that sometimes because uh, in license plates there's not enough room for uh, things to be written and so it's not uncommon for people to use the words without uh, vowels and usually the consonants are more important for distinguishing the words. Um, uh, in Hebrew today, they write it without uh, vowels and you just have to know. Um, but uh, the Masoretes uh, mostly wrote it above and below the text according to the, uh, actually according to the uh, book that says they, they wrote it, period. Uh, but there are a few vowels that are put into the text, uh, specifically the long U has a little dot in the middle. And also the, they show you how to pronounce some of the consonants more precisely with dots in the middle. And uh, the Masoretes also noted unusual words. So if a word was only used in that particular way, um, in that particular form, once in scripture, they would actually have a little circle. And then on the side, there would be a little lamed for only once. And then they would, if it was used twice, there would be a little circle and there would be a, a beth. So that told you that there was only two. Um, they also noted apparent errors, and one of the interesting things is they were very careful not to correct them. Uh, they left the consonants just the way they found them, and then off to the side they would put what it really should be. Um, they would have the, the, the part in the text would be known as kithib, which comes from katab to write. So it was the written way, and then the kare, which is the pronounced way, the way you called it. And, uh, and so basically when you were reading you had, uh, you had notes as to, I think this is a mistake, but nobody would ever put that into the text itself. Um, and uh, one of the things they did was uh, reverence the divine name and uh, one of the things they did there was to put dots above it uh, where uh, and below it that said you're supposed to pronounce this as Adonai instead of we don't really know for sure what it is the best guess we can do from some Greek transcriptions and stuff is uh, perhaps it was pronounced as in Yahweh but nobody knows for sure because they wouldn't pronounce the name. They'd come to it and they'd read Adonai instead of Yahweh. And if you put the vowels for Adonai with the letters for Yahweh, you get Yahuwah, which has uh, uh, been usually translated Jehovah. And uh, uh, that's, of course, the divine name as you will read it in the King James Version in certain places. Um, well, were they that careful before? Well, it turns out that they were close to that careful, at least, in the Talmudic and Mishnaic eras, which is the second to century, seventh centuries AD. They actually counted all the letters in the entire books of Moses, and the middle letter was the wow, or vav, in the word uh, ghwn, which is belly, in Leviticus 11.42. And the middle word was the word sought in Leviticus 10, 16. And the middle verse was Le Le Leviticus 13, 13. They had all that down. And, and one of the th things about that is that you actually had somebody who is paid to check copies of the scriptures for accuracy, apparently out of temple funds. And uh, so you could bring your written copy of the Bible to him and say, is this any good? And he'd go through and he'd say, nope, it's off. Or he'd say, no, it's good. And, that, and so they had some very careful checks in that era. Um, now, there were also some early versions of the Septuagint um, 
that had variants that were different from what you saw in the Hebrew text. And uh, uh, probably in the, in the, not, the books of Moses were very, very carefully done. Um, but some other books, they kind of got sloppy, and particularly Daniel and Esther had whole sections added. There's the prayer of the three worthies that you won't find in the Hebrew, but you will find in the Greek of the Septuagint. Um, the translation is much more tight in the books of Moses, the uh, Torah, than they are in, let's say, Job, Esther, Proverbs, Isaiah, and Daniel. And in Esther and Daniel, it just completely goes off the wall in certain places. Uh, then there is the version of the Samaritan Pentateuch, which is written in the old style Hebrew letters, or more precisely, descendants from those old style. I think we have a question here. I'm sorry, you might have mentioned this, but I might have missed it. Why is the Torah more literal than Job, Esther, Proverbs, Isaiah, and Daniel? Probably because they felt it to be more holy. There were three sections of scriptures, the Torah, uh, the Nabi'im, that's the prophets, and the Ketubim, which is the writings. And you may remember in the New Testament, it refers to uh, the uh, law, the prophets, and the Psalms. That's the Torah and the uh, Nevi'im, and then it is also the first of the writings, the Psalms. And in fact, in, if you get a Hebrew Bible, it's arranged in that precise way. There, the books of Moses are first, and then it goes into Joshua and Judges and so forth. Ruth is in the writings, by the way. Um, and by, uh, by loose, what do you mean by loose? The book of Ruth. Well, I, no, but loose. Literal versus loose. How oh, loo how loose, loose is means loose? that the translation uh, is not so much word for word. It's more of a translation of sense. Um, if you get the uh, the uh, New American Standard Bible, for example, each word will actually have a Hebrew word behind it. If you read, um, let's say. The Living Bible, it's much more of a paraphrase. The King James tends to be more on the literal side. Uh, and all of its, um, the New King James and so forth are the same way. Um, uh, and and it's, it's a philosophical uh, question as to how you translate the text. Um, and in, in, in Job and Esther, you know, they just, it isn't a word-for-word -word translation from, from uh, Hebrew into Greek. Yes. But doesn't every translation by necessity involve some form of paraphrasing because you have to uh, somehow convey the, the original meaning from one language into an appropriate counterpart in another language where if you literally translated the word itself, it would in fact convey a completely different meaning from the intended one. Uh, yes. Um. And um, there are trade-offs both ways. But some people tend to try to make it more precise by translating it as close to the original as possible. And some people will try to give more of the gestalt without worrying about whether it's exactly, uh, you can defend each word from the original. Um, 
and there are advantages and disadvantages of each. And of course, um, the looser translation actually, if it's done well, in a certain sense is better because the new reader gets the idea that's trying to be gotten across. The problem that you'll run into is that the new translation uh, that is loose will also be more interpretive and if you have somebody who um, uh, is off it's easier to be off and 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 you have less recourses to try to find out what's going on in the original and of course the ideal is to learn it in the original language um, which is one of the reasons why uh, people who are deeply into biblical study still learn some Greek and Hebrew is because you can get into the original from uh, from that, and and you can you can see where the translations are coming from, but you're not totally dependent on them. Whereas if you all you know is English, for example, um, then you're kind of dependent on the translator, and that's one of the reasons why if people are doing Bible study, it's not a bad idea to have three or four versions. Uh, of the text and try to uh, try to s see where the text is coming from because I, I think it uh, will make it more easy to understand. Uh, yes, uh, is the mic still there? Well, well, isn't isn't all of this the reason that Ellen White says in the front of the Great Controversy that we go by? thought inspiration instead of each word being uh, inspired. Yes, Al although people eventually get uh, enough respect for the word that they, they wind up kind of trying to preserve the exact words because they don't really have much else uh, to get back to the thought behind it. And I, I think we have to be careful about making this too exact, but it's still uh, what it shows is that the, um, the ancient Hebrews had a great deal of respect for the, the Torah and were much more careful with how it was translated. The Samaritan Pentateuch came off at about the 5th century BC and kept its own separate uh, tr tradition. Now there's a couple of places where uh, most people concede that it's, um, there are obvious interpolations regarding uh, how you should worship only on Mount Gerizim, where you don't find that in the uh, text of the Hebrew Bible, um, and you don't find it in the Septuagint uh, uh, tradition either, and it it's, looks suspiciously like somebody put that in. Um, and there was a big debate as to wh which was more reliable, the, the Greek translation, the uh, Hebrew, which we had late copies, or the uh, Samaritan Pentateuch, or perhaps it was all hopelessly confused. And then in 1947, the first of the Dead Sea Scrolls came to be found, and there were massive fragments of the Old Testament, including in a nearly complete copy of the book of Isaiah. It was obviously complete at one time. I think there's a few little holes in it, but uh, other than that, it's uh, perfectly fine. And uh, there was a basically complete text, and there's another one that uh, has a little more wear on it, uh, but it's also mostly complete. Um, and one of the surprises that people had was that words had spaces between them. And the reason that that was a surprise is because in Greek, of, in the Greek of that era, they didn't have spaces, they just kept writing, and all the words were squished together and you had to know enough Greek to be able to separate them and say, oh, this belongs here and this belongs there. And sometimes that made a difference in meaning, as, as you may imagine in English. Um, uh, if you say God is nowhere, it makes a difference from if you're saying God is now here. And it's only a space between words that makes the difference. Um, and uh, uh, what they found out was that way back when they had uh, spaces between them, and in fact, in pre-exilic, uh, they actually have dots between the words. 
This is a pre-exilic Hebrew in, uh, from the Dan Stila. And you'll notice, for example, here is Melech. You can almost make these letters out because they're close enough to English. This is the ancient Hebrew. And uh, this looks like M, and that looks like L. And if you turn that backwards, that looks like a K. And that's precisely what they are. And then you see this little dot here. And so that's King, Melech. And this is Y, Yod. And notice that it has shrunken considerably uh, in the post-exilic writing. And then that's Shin, although in this particular case it's Sin. Uh, Resh looks like a P, doesn't it? It's actually, um, it's like the Greek row. And then uh, this looks like an A that's been turned around, and that's precisely what it is. It's an Aleph. And then here's another Lamed, L. So this is Yisrael, or Israel. This, this is the king of Israel. And th it kind of interestingly, uh, there's a word down here, Be, uh, Beth, uh, Yod, and Tau, and then Daleth, uh, Wow, and Daleth, which is Beit David, or the house of David. And uh, this was a bit of a shocker because there were a lot of people that didn't believe that the house of David existed at that time. Um, and that's one of the things that the Steely of Dan. But notice that there's a dot at the end of there, and this is all kind of interestingly, the house of David, all one word. Um, uh, but you can see that there's dots between all of these uh, words. And that was kind of a, a bit of a surprise to uh, people who were speculating as to what pre as to what Hebrew had. Um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, 60% of them were proto-Masoretic. 5% were like the Septuagint. And interestingly, uh, Deuteronomy, where... Uh, Hebrews quotes and that all the angels of God worship him. And if you try to look for that in your Hebrew copies of Deuteronomy or your English translations, you won't find them, at least the older English translations. But there is a Dead Sea Scroll that has in all the, let all the angels worship him, which means that that's one of the places that kind of got dropped out maybe. Uh, you know, raising the question as to whether uh, Sometimes the variants might actually go in favor of Christianity. Um, and 5% uh, are more closely related to the, Septu uh, the Samaritan Pentateuch than anywhere else. And then there's about 20%, including the big Isaiah scroll, that uh, are kind of uh, more loose than average. The smaller Isaiah scroll is very much like the uh, Masoretic text. Um, Uh, MacGyver notes that it's remarkable that the text survived at all. If you think about it, there are escaped slaves that mostly lived in marginal hill country until um, they conquered the whole country under David and Solomon. Uh, David did not have a huge capital. It was like about 2,000. Solomon is estimated as having about 5,000 people in his capital. Uh, it's not a very big place. Um, the kings of Israel were not uh, favorable to the worship of Yahweh, and the kings of Judah were mostly unfavorable to uh, the worship of Yahweh, including Manasseh, who lived for longer than anybody else, except for maybe Isaiah. And um, then there was the exile where, where uh, Judean society completely disappeared, and a small group returned under Ezra, and you think about it, that's, they have kept these scrolls alive for that entire time. As James Barr would say, the Hebrew manuscript text of the Old Testament shows a high degree of uniformity. This characteristic constitutes a peculiarity of the Old Testament, uh, of Old Testament textual criticism. To summarize, um, uh, there was careful coffee careful copying of the Old Testament, in particular the books of Moses, which include Genesis, which is what we're studying. Um, 
Um, there were some changes, but not very many. And none of them that really changed the, te the sense of the text significantly. There was very high respect for the Torah. It was written uh, when it was actually translated. It was done in a very literal style, as befits some, uh, something that somebody does not want to have their own ideas put in, but try to reflect as near as possible the ideas that were in there to begin with. And there are multiple copies of Genesis in the, uh, including some in the old script in uh, Qumran. And he finishes with the, the final uh, paragraph, the textual history of Genesis, like that of the whole Hebrew Bible, is one of remarkable survival and of great care taken in ensuring that accurate copies were made. Most who know about this history conclude that while the credibility or otherwise of the book of Genesis depends on many factors, some of whom we'll discuss later in the book and we've discussed earlier, whether or not an accurate copy of the original text has survived is not one of them. The text we have today, while it may show some minor changes, is essentially what was originally written, a fact that strongly suggests that the text of Genesis is indeed credible. Now, my own view of this is I agree with Dr. MacGyver. Uh, I think that, the, that uh, this is where it fits into the plan of the book. It's in the defense of the scriptural story of Genesis. The first chapter we saw last week said that there is such a thing as propositional revelation. That, that ideas can be conveyed, that the text now we're talking about here, and the text, in fact, is reliable. It's what was written down to begin with. The word speaks for itself. Uh, Genesis is, in fact, theo theologically sound. There are two chapters on that. Uh, that Genesis is ancient, and um, the tablet theory of Genesis will be uh, raised in that chapter. Um, and I think a direct challenge will be made to the idea that Genesis was uh, put together as, uh, as uh, uh, basically the JEDP theory, the documentary hypothesis of the Pentateuch. Uh, question? Um, Genesis describes a recent creation that creation and biblical theology are mutually supportive and that the New Testament supports the Genesis creation. And finally, that creation is more compatible with Jesus and Christology than evolution is. And then finally, they're going to deal with the scientific arguments in a number of different chapters and talk about ethics and theistic evolution. So that's kind of where we're going, and that's where this fits in. And so what... Um, if, if I can put it this way, you know, the text is not usually a matter of debate. That's not always been the case. That in fact, there was a time when the text was a matter of debate. And the Dead Sea Scrolls have kind of mostly settled that. It is fair to call attention to these two facts. I think that this is one of those things where there used to be questions, there aren't any more this is a place where the biblical record has stood up. Um, this is not, at least to me, the most exciting chapter in the entire book, but I think it's still important. And with that, I will invite questions and comments. Um, we have a comment in the back. Let's see, where's the, the mic? Yeah. I'm going to pass this back. Yes. Some years ago, there was a collection of Bibles. I believe it was over in the Geoscience Building. And seems like the guy that collected them had over 800 versions of the English Bible. 
I don't know whether any of the rest of you saw that exhibit, but it was quite impressive. But it does leave you wondering, why do we need 800 different versions? Ellen White says God has protected scripture so that we can get the, the message out of it, whether we are Greek and Hebrew scholars or not. So we can have confidence, I think, in scripture, uh, even though there may be myriad versions. Well, you know, for a long time, Adventists have uh, kind of stuck with the standard translation of King James, I, partly because we're familiar with it and partly because where there are problems with the translation, we're familiar with those problems. And every time you get a new translation, then you have to look it over and how does it deal with this text, how does it deal with that text, and then uh, basically go back. That, you know, the real thing you should be doing is to go back to the Hebrew and say, is this a good translation? And uh, uh, is it something that we can learn uh, out of? Um, and uh, several things happen with language. One of them is that the way we use language changes with time. Nobody uses the and thou anymore, and so the New King James has come along and omitted all that. Although, in a way, it's kind of nice sometimes to have it because then you know that uh, the original was intended to be singular. Uh, in Hebrew in particular, there are singular uh, second person words that are different from, let's say, plural second person words. And, and in, in English, you has become ambiguous. Uh, I, if I say, uh, uh, you, you're studying your, your Bible, uh, it's not clear whether I'm talking about you personally or the whole group here. Um, and uh, in fact, one of the things that's happened in English is if you want to make that really, really clear and you're from the South, you say, y'all are studying your Bibles. <laughs> in the years past, I used the New American Standard I was impressed that they went back and made corrections in the different uh, issues, even in something as small as uh, an aorist punctiliar phrase or something. And this is done, I suppose, by a large group of various uh, persuasions, different churches. And I always felt confident that it would be a good version if they were always making these little corrections. Well, I would have to agree. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting is what we have come up with is that, in fact, the Hebrew Bible that we have is good, valid, and a good English translation of that Hebrew Bible is a good study guide and that you probably get about 98% of the meaning out of a good version. Maybe you get about 95% out of a not so good version. Um, every once in a while there'll be some group that has their own agenda and that wants to specifically translate certain things in certain ways to support their own doctrinal uh, beliefs. And it's one of the reasons why I think it's good that until until the clear word, there wasn't actually an Adventist translation. We were actually using other people's translations uh, for most of our Bible study. And that meant that uh, the Bibles we used were non-sectarian, and I think that was helpful. Uh, yes? Yeah. I was wondering, uh, what do you think Ellen G. White, when she said that uh, the Bible can be trusted it's accurate. Uh, what version of the Bible was she talking about? What, was she thinking about the Hebrew Bible, the Masoretic text, the Vulgate, or, or the Septuagint, or uh, the King James Version? And I would like to add that although she emphasizes the fact that we can trust the Bible, she herself stated that when manuscripts were few, some copies to make the Bible clearer change some words. 
And instead of clarifying, they did the opposite. And uh, I was reading a new version of the Bible that has a lots of comments in which points variations. In a, I lost count, hundreds of instances where it says, not in the majority of manuscripts. So I would suggest that the 800 versions of the Bible, if we could use all of them, would be beneficial probably. What do you think? What you will find is that much of the time, uh, the variants really don't make any difference in the, in the general sense of the text. Um, Ellen White used the King James. She also used one or two of the more, uh, the newer versions in her day. And, um, and if you read them side by side, the sense you get, if you don't push the text too hard, is actually very much the same. And that's why I say, you don't get 100% out of a translation. Um, you get 98% out of a good translation. Uh, and if you have two good translations, you can probably get 99% because you can compare the two and maybe get a third translation and, and see uh, what's the closest you can get. Uh, if you want 100%, you're probably stuck with learning Hebrew. And most of us don't do that. Are you dismissing the Septuagint? Uh, not in all cases. In, in, uh, in the one case that I cited, where it says, let all the angels of God worship him, and uh, that isn't found in the Hebrew, except that it is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, that's one that I think that uh, was dropped out by, uh, Jews found two different manuscripts, and they liked the one better because the, uh, uh, because the Christians were effectively using that text. And so they chose the manuscript that was more towards their theological purpose, uh, presuppositions and may very well have been the minority text at that point. Uh, so there is some bias and sometimes it actually, um, the original text may favor Christianity more than, uh, uh, than you would expect if you uh, got all your learning from a secular institution. Uh, so I think there's a comment back behind and then, I, yeah, and then uh, we'll come forward. You know, I'm kind of at the point where I'm questioning whether that if a person actually knew Hebrew, if it really benefits him that much. Because say that you come to me and you say, well, you'll get a better idea of what was originally intended if you knew Hebrew. Okay, so if I go to a Hebrew class, I'll have to learn Hebrew from a teacher. And then, <laughs> and then um, even if I get an A, I'm gonna, they're going to say, uh, I'm going to say, well, even if I get an A, I've only learned what that teacher has taught me. I don't know if he's correct or not with what he's doing. Then if I take maybe Hebrew 2, I might get a different teacher. And you can kind of start comparing the two teachers and maybe you can start vectoring off into a better direction. But then even after that, if I did that till I knew the complete dictionary of Hebrew, well, then I'd have to start improving from that by actually thinking in Hebrew. And then when you start think, thinking in Hebrew, well, then how long does it take before you start gelling in your head, you know, how to use those words so that they, you can think? And then after that, you need to be able to converse with different people that have been thinking in Hebrew so that you will then become knowledgeable enough to even get a deeper understanding. So here I am starting from zero. So what good is it for me at my age to start <laughs> learning Hebrew? 
For, for most of us, it's probably not practical. <laughs> Be perfectly honest. I mean, I'm, I'm always a person that says that the more you know, the better off you are. Um, but uh, that's why I say, uh, you know, at, uh, what do you do if your teacher has a wrong idea of what the, uh, uh, I mean, we've, in, in this class, we've had a dispute over what precisely the rakia is supposed to mean. Um, and one or the other is partially incorrect, or both. You can't go to your teacher and find out, because your teacher got it from somewhere, and they got it from somewhere, and they got it some, from somewhere. Um, if, if you're really going to find out, you're not only going to have to learn what Hebrew you can, but you're also going to have to learn uh, you're going to have to study the text carefully and read it sensitively. Uh, one of the things that we hope to be able to do is to do some of that work for you so you can see. But at the same time, one of the things I'm going to try to do, and, and I have tried to do, and I hope it uh, succeeded partly, is when we get into that kind of discussion to show you the underlying reasons why and not just say, my Hebrew teacher told me, and therefore this is what I'll accept, or the theological word book of the Old Testament says this, or the uh, uh, theological dictionary of the New Testament says this, because those are just, those are people. They're well-studied people, but none of them were there when it was written down either. We're all looking at it this through a glass darkly. Um, and you can actually do most of that studying. Uh, that's one of the nice things about you know, getting a concordance and reading the text in various places. And then you can kind of try to put things together on your own, even if you don't know Hebrew as, as fluently as it would be nice to know. And the fact of the matter is that at least at some places, I still decipher Hebrew rather than read it because my vocabulary is not as great as I would want. Um, and nobody will ever be uh, perfect in this field. And so, you know, while I think it's a good idea to know as much as you can, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're ever going to come to a point where you will be the authority. And that's kind of scary. What it means is that nobody really absolutely knows for sure. And the translations actually, like I say, do contain probably about 98%, the good ones anyway. And even the bad ones probably contain about 95%, which means that you can take just about any translation and read it carefully. And uh, most of the time you'll, get, uh, you'll understand what you're trying to. Uh, we have a uh, linguist and then an English <coughs> person. <clears throat> I have loved listening to CDs. They provide nice, high-fidelity sound and um, nice, crisp, you know, beautiful music. And I've been listening to it so much that that I assume that I have always been listening to that kind of music that level of fidelity of music. And then I discovered, after unpacking some uh, packages that uh, were still packed after a previous move, uh, some long playing records and some <laughs> 35s, and I believe I found even a 78 somewhere. And, and, and there was quite a stack of them. And, and my wife, of course, was very partial to Simon and Garfunkel uh, that she got while she was in Australia. And of course, I liked Bridge Over Troubled Waters, and I wanted to hear the original record. Forget this copies. So 
we uh, splurged. We went to a special music store where we could get a, a current nice spiffy turntable. It even had a stroboscope to make sure that the speed is just right and everything is honky dory. And then we got it plugged into our amp and nice stereophonic sound. And we were amazed at the number of crackles and hisses and wheezes and all kinds of things <laughs> that I had never heard before. So how is it that I had never heard all that noise before, but once I have become accustomed to CD quality sound, now it stood out like a sore thumb. It was like, oh. um, And I was thinking to myself, you know, this is remarkable. I thought I was going to the original. Yet, it, it, didn't, <laughs> it didn't sound <laughs> half as good as the CDs. You know? <laughs> so, the moral of the story, brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, all communication always involves at least two, possibly three components. One is the signal. Mm -hmm. Two is the noise. Three is the artifact. We wish to minimize artifact as far as possible to zero. We always wish to maximize signal to noise ratio as far as possible. That is what we consider mm, higher fidelity. Yeah? The problem is we can never make the noise zero because all transmission always includes some noise. I mean, even when I speak sometimes, my throat starts crackling for whatever reason. I get a frog in the throat. And, and sometimes even when I'm speaking clearly, I blurt out some word and I think, wait a minute, that wasn't what I intended. How did that one come out? Y you know what I'm saying? There's no frog in your throat in case you're wondering. That's right, yes. Sometimes you get a uh, brain blip, you know? So, uh, and you, you kind of wonder, wait a minute, that wasn't the idea I was working on. Um, but the moral of the story, brothers and sisters, regardless of the level of noise or artifact or whatever else there is, none of that can somehow be used to deny the presence of the signal. And that is precisely the kind of argument that has been used to undermine the credibility of the Bible by stating that there has been no communication from God. Because of this or that inconsistency, this or that bit of noise, this or that little artifact here and there. You, you get the point? If we did that kind of thinking with science, we would never have an experiment that's publishable. It cannot be done. You just have to do the best you can and always know in the back of your head that it's possible that you have overlooked something. That is why we continue learning all the time. But it doesn't mean that you suddenly deny there is a reality or that there is a truth. Oh, we don't believe in truth. What on earth is that? Then you're left with nothing but an imagination in bed. And you can never do anything or think anything concrete. So you see, ultimately, the arguments that have been leveled against the Bible are of such a nature that if they were applied to anything else, regardless of what discipline it comes from, that discipline would be totally destroyed. It cannot stand. You can't do anything. You can't do woodworking that way. So how is it that these people, <coughs> who deem themselves so clever and smart, cannot see this salient little 
bit of truth. That if you are going to have such a battle, there must be something of value that you are fighting. So the question is, why? And you want to understand, why do I have that battle, particularly against Genesis? And, more recently, against Second Coming. Now, those two are the bookends of the Bible. You know, you start with Genesis, and you end with Second Coming. Uh, how much do you have left if you can't stand those two? Well, I think that... Um if, if, if pass it up this way, and uh, we'll have one here, and then we have a hand right here. Just one brief uh, comment uh, about these 800 Bibles that were mentioned. Uh, as far as I know, the collection is still here in Loma Linda. Uh, it's owned by uh, Jim Baden. He uh, is usually with Ken Hart's class. He occasionally comes here and so on, but it, it, it's uh, very valuable and extremely fascinating. Uh, asset that we have here. Okay. Um, okay. Interesting lady here. And uh, um, first up, up okay. here, you've been patiently waiting. A number of years ago, I bought a book on how to learn Hebrew, and it was very clear and very interesting. And then the author said, "By the time you get through with this book, you're not going to know very much about Hebrew." So I decided not to study Hebrew. What I do is I make a collection of Bibles. And the first thing I look at is the people who did the translation and what their qualifications are. And I figure that with their expertise and lifetimes of study, I can compare Bible with Bible and come up with a pretty good idea of what anybody who is a scholar is going to have to say about the Hebrew or the Greek without me having to learn Hebrew and Greek. Uh, that's probably true. I think one of the important things that, that's coming out of this is this article is not so much in defense of doing Hebrew instead of English or instead of some other language. What it's really saying is that the Hebrew that we have is excellent Hebrew. It's, excellent, it's an excellent tra uh, transmission of the original text that to use the terminology um, of uh, Dr. Boscovich, it's uh, the signal-to-noise ratio is extremely high. I think the same thing can be said of translations. Uh, the, the English translations of, of the Hebrew are probably like, uh, you can get uh, you know, 50 to 1 signal-to-noise, which is really quite good. And the point of it is that you actually can have that kind of confidence in the scriptures. Um, both the transmission of the text we have and also, I would say, the translations as well. Um, I think that we make a mistake when we assume that if we could understand even exactly um, the original language that, something was, uh, that the Bible was written in, then we would understand the Bible because um, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So if you look at the religious leaders of Jesus' time who had the advantage of understanding the text, it was still like a foreign language to them because they were using their own human understanding to interpret it. So when it comes to our own understanding or interpretation of the Bible, um, regardless of what language we speak, like the Holy Spirit has promised to impress us. And so he's like the translator um, because I think it's like showing too much pride to say that if we could just figure a word out, then we would understand the things of God. Uh, I think that that's an important point. And, and I think that one of, the, one of the things that can come out of this that's, that's important is that you shouldn't avoid studying your Bible because there are some scholars who say that the text isn't very good. The fact of the matter is the text is very good. And the translations are very good. And you can listen to it and hear the signal. And the important thing to do is to listen for that signal and to try to understand it and to ask God to take your prejudice is out of it so that you actually listen to what the text is saying rather than trying to fit it into your preconceived ideas. 
And I think that's where the Holy Spirit comes in, is to try to take away our own prejudices and allow the text to speak to us today. But that process won't even get started when people say, ah, oh, but the text, who knows what it said then? Who knows whether the translations are any good? Who knows? And, and you know, the, the kinds of doubts that are commonly sown, and I think in some cases it's fair to say call them sown by people, um, uh, you can read this stuff. You can understand it, and it's worth the effort. Uh, yes. Yeah, I'd like to say um, I, I totally agree with what she said. We can take Mrs. White's writings, which are in English. We know English, and we still fight with them and fight with them. Um, but I think that uh, looking here in John 7, uh, 17, you know, Mrs. White talks about you know, we struggle over all this little stuff while we're not living up to the obvious stuff over here, the light that we have. And here's a text that says, If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. So we have to live what we know before we can know all these other little things. They'll fall into place once we start living the obvious. So God doesn't necessarily tell me I'm going to understand this little point over here unless I'm living the big point over here. In fact, I go further and I would say that if you don't want to live the big point over here. You'll never learn the little ones. That the, that the little ones will start confusing you and you'll start using them in ways that will justify your missing the big point. I agree 100%, absolutely. Uh, yes. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think that many of us would like to have 800 copies of the Bible in our library, but most of us cannot afford. And if I could afford, I wouldn't have the money to buy so many copies of the Bible. But I discovered that in spite of the fact that I have many copies of the Bible, I can get by with without a single copy of the Bible because I have a computer and internet has made things so easy for me that I can with the click of a mouse get maybe 30 or 40 versions of a single verse. All That's I need to do is type a few words and I get those references. It's even and better than that. Not if only you, that, uh, excuse me. There's a BibleGateway.com yeah. uh, where you can get uh, versions of the Bible and if you don't like English you can get Spanish, Portuguese, uh, uh, Vietnamese, whatever. No. And, uh, and you can get back to the original Greek and Hebrew. In fact, if you, if you have a question as to whether you know, the majority text or the Textus Receptus or the more modern versions, they're also available. Uh, it's not just somewhere on the internet, it's actually connected at a site. And then they have a blue letter Bible where you can look at the English translations and find out what the Hebrew words were behind it and they'll give you numbers so that if you can't read Hebrew you can still figure it out. Okay, um, thank you very much. I was going to mention that because one day somebody was arguing with me on, on the blog about the meaning of certain Hebrew words. I have never studied Hebrew, so I decided to take the challenge. I just took the Hebrew Bible, copied it, and pasted it, and got the meaning, the diverse meaning of that word. And I could discuss the, the probably probable meaning of the text without ever studying Hebrew. So, I mean, the internet has made things so easy for us to study the Bible that we should take advantage. I prefer, over the one you mentioned, I prefer Biblos, Biblos source. It, I mean, the way I, it's easier for me to find things I need. Yes. <coughs> 
Have you ever looked at Young's literal translation? Um, not much. Uh, the reason why is because if I really want to go back to it, I'll just go back to the Hebrew, but uh, not everybody has that advantage. And so Young's literal translation is pretty good for somebody who doesn't uh, have that kind of access. Exactly. You've got all the words. I mean, interpretation is out the window. You've got to do that yourself because it reads backwards and upside down and left. You know, I mean, you can't read it, but at least you, have, you know what the words are. Yeah. And I guess if you want to go further, you can get an interlinear. But it's nice because now you don't have to buy a big, thick book. You just type yeah. a few words on the Internet and you can get it. Yeah, Bible Gateway does have a Young's. In the I, I'd have to look, but I think it would. Yes. So there's a great chapter, um, First Selected Messages, Chapter 1, on the inspiration of the Bible. So there's just a brief quote here. Some look to us gravely and say, don't you think there might have been some mistakes in the copyist or in the translators? This is all probable, she says. And then skipping down, it says, all the mistakes will not cause trouble to one soul or cause any feet to stumble that would not manufacture difficulties from the plainest revealed truth. So as a whole, she has a whole lot. Yeah. Of well, so first selected I, message. Yeah, I think the conclusion of this chapter is correct. The Hebrew text at one time was claimed to be corrupt. It's not. I would go further and say that there are people who would make cl similar claims about the translations. Uh, most of the time, th they were done by sincere people who were trying their best to convey what they understood the Hebrew to be in English. And most of the time, they're reliable. And where they're not, if you read the entire Bible, you'll figure out that this, there's a problem text here, and you'll be able to, f to correct it. Um. I wonder if you've ever thought there might be dangerous Bibles. I'm thinking of paraphrases. I'm thinking of um, the, gospel, the, the, the cotton patch gospel, where instead of Jesus going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, he goes from Natchez to Memphis or something like that. And the Gullah Bible, there seem to be a number of things around that could be dangerous to read. Well, the King James can be dangerous if your heart isn't right. Um, I think that one of the things about those kinds of Gospels is you have to take them with a certain fairly decent sized grain of salt. And once you do and you don't rely on them too hard to be actually a literal translation, they will sometimes put people into an experience that will help them to understand what this is coming to. I mean, Jerusalem and Jericho are foreign to many people who have spent all their lives in, let's say, uh, southern Appalachia or, uh, you know, uh, perhaps Mississippi. And the Cotton Patch Bible brings this kind of home to them as, as they, they're seeing what's happening. It's, it's kind of a preacher's uh, Bible, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but if you recognize that this is obviously not a literal translation and you don't rely on it too much, it can perhaps be helpful. Again, it depends as much on the heart as it does on the actual words. And I think that that's one of the lessons that is coming out of this. The Bible is, in fact, the Bible that we have is, in fact, dependable. The problem that we have doesn't have to do with the Bible not being dependable. And in fact, if the first uh, 10 or 12 chapters of this book, uh, whatever it is, if the first uh, uh, section of the book does anything, and uh, uh, what I would hope it would be is to clear out all of the theological cobwebs that people have tried to make into mountains. Uh, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Uh, yeah, uh, but to allow us to understand that the real problem with Genesis that most people have doesn't have anything to do with how the text was transmitted or translated or anything like that. It has to do with the 600-pound gorilla of science 
that is influencing people to try to find any way out of having a literal six-day creation only a few thousand years ago and that we just we need more time we need more accommodation to evolution and how it has uh, helped create life and that's the real problem it doesn't have anything to do at all with the theology that in fact the theology is sound it's that people don't want to believe that theology because it conflicts with the uh, zeitgeist of our age the spirit Paul, of our age Paul, uh, yes Jim just came in maybe you could tell us where the collection is yeah um, uh, the church provides a new international version, at least they have in the past, and Jeremiah 7.22 says, I did not just give them instructions regarding sacrifices and bird offerings. And the clear word followed that, but the word just is not in there. There's no reason for it to be there. And in fact, uh, Bruce Metzger says there's no reason for that, because he's the editor of the... Uh, 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 revised standard and the new revised standard so um, and then the clear word also says one of the earlier editions anyway I will pre pray I will pray for the father for you also or I will be praying for the father uh, also in John 16 25 and 26 but it's not there but they puts it in in the clear word which is just backward well that's uh, that is a problem with translation when people are trying to interpret yeah and that's one of the reasons why if you're trying to be as faithful as possible to the text, generally speaking, it's easier to have it be a more literal translation and let people figure out what uh, the original was trying to convey. Um, I don't mind reading paraphrases, but I'd rather, have, I'd rather have a literal translation and then maybe use the paraphrases. This is how somebody looked at it. I asked Jack Blanco why he did that by telephone uh, years ago. Well, he, I got all Ellen White and, and uh, the Bible all running together. But I, I have no problem with it. Put it in his footnotes or, or, yeah. or, or in parentheses. But uh, to run well, the text together is, is, is distorting and misleading. I, I agree. I, I tend to have more respect for the text. For me, signal to noise is important. And every time we add to the Bible, we are adding what we hope is signal, but we're unavoidably adding noise. And that's why I think that the Masoretes idea of leaving it in right where it is and then explaining what you think it is on the margins is the best policy. Uh, Jim, uh, mention was made earlier of your collection of Bibles. Uh, where is it? Where, where is the collection? Yeah. <laughs> well. It's in my home. <laughs> right here. I have almost, an, almost, uh, almost a thousand English translations. Now, obviously, they're not full Bibles. Uh, mm. A lot of them are just uh, New Testaments, and uh, some of them are just one or two books. But uh, I have close to a thousand different English translations. I've reprinted over a over hundred different English out of print translations. Well, I think with that, we will close. Um, Next week, we'll be talking uh, about uh, uh, Davidson's chapter, I should say, uh, Joanne Davidson's chapter, because there's uh, one by Richard Davidson as well.